and I'm sure we'll have people join us as, uh, as they come on board. Um, so today I have with me, well, my, na my name's Greg Basford from the e-learning team here in, um, in Leichhardt. And with me we have uh, Gordon uh, Bobbin. Uh, Gordon's our Cloud Chair Support Officer um, for this term. And uh, Gordon, there he is. Just zoom in on Gordon a bit. There you go. Get a good look. Too much. Yeah, get a good look at Gordon. No, no, no. Don't want that. Um, so Gordon um, is uh, is working with us this term, and uh, he's done uh, a great job so far, uh, helping uh, out a number of schools with teacher dashboards. Some of you maybe may have already had some interaction with Gordon over that, but today Gordon's going to be leading our session on flipping the classroom. So uh, today's session, as I said, is on flipping the classroom. Uh, I guess what we wanted to do was make you aware that this is the second of uh, three sessions that we're running this term. Uh, the next and the final session for this term is on Tuesday, March the 25th, same time, uh, same channel, 07404, and that'll be on Teacher Productivity with CloudShare. And that'll be, I guess, specifically um, uh, looking at uh, the way that you can integrate some of the Google tools to increase, uh, sorry, increase your productivity. Um, so. With that, and, and the links obviously to that document, um, uh, you should have that in sent that out a number of times. Uh, if you don't know how to get a hold of that document, just email Gordon and I and we'll send it out again to you. Uh, and you use the document to, to go to the registration form. I'm sure some of you have already registered. Uh, so uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll make a start and I'll hand over to Gordon. We'll start the session. Thanks. Great. All right. Thanks, uh, Greg. And uh, just again, um, welcome everyone. And uh, thanks for taking the time. I know for a lot of you, a Thursday means sport day, which is an early finish. So appreciate you all hanging around a little bit later for this. Uh, just before I do start, just to point out, uh, you might want to pass this on to some other colleagues. Uh, if you didn't know already, these sessions are recorded and we upload links to the videos on this same schedule. So you'll notice that there is a link now to the first session that uh, Greg ran a couple of weeks ago. So this session in about a week's time, you should be able to find a link to that uh, here for anyone who might want to watch it uh, who wasn't able to make it this afternoon. Okay, so I'll get into this presentation. Uh, the presentation is called, of course, Flipping the Classroom. Um, I'm aware that uh, some of you may already know a little bit about this, um, but also some of you may uh, have no idea what flipping the classroom is. So I'll try and do this in a way that it caters to everyone um, so that everyone can pick up and, and know uh, what it's all about. And just to give you a little out, what I will include in this session. So obviously we'll start with what uh, flipping actually is. For those of you who have never heard of it before or have no idea about this method of teaching. Uh, I'll then go through uh, some examples and some of the benefits of flipping uh, and also some of the considerations that need to be made. Uh, after we've done that, we'll then get started on how to flip and I'll take you through how to actually go about creating those videos and those uh, screencasts uh, and the structure to your lessons. And then hopefully at the end, uh, we'll have some time for some discussion and some questions. Uh, and I'm hoping too for uh, some suggestions from you guys about ideas of how you might be able to use this method of teaching in your classroom. Keeping in mind too that I, I'm trying to cater for both primary and secondary uh, classrooms with this as well. So, having said that, the first question of course is, what is it? What is flipping? Uh, well, look, to put it very simply, it means to take what you would normally do in class and set this for homework and take what you would normally set for homework and have this completed in the classroom. Now, I will just have you bear in mind there are other uses to it aside from just homework, and that's something I'll get into a little bit later and will probably be particularly useful to, to primary teachers. Um, if you wanted a more technical definition of what flipped learning is, uh, this is a definition that was developed by the Flipped Learning Network, and I'll just give our credit to Chris Morris, who, who uh, Pointed out to this, uh, pointed this out to me. Um, so it says there that flipped learning is a pedagogical approach in which direct instruction moves from the group learning space to the individual learning space, and the resulting group space is transformed into a dynamic, interactive learning environment where the educator guides students as they apply concepts and engage creatively in the subject matter. Now that's 
basically just saying what that first definition uh, is trying to say to you. So if you think about how the direct instruction uh, is moving from the group learning space, well, that's basically that instruction that you would normally do in the classroom and transferring that to the individual learning space, which is where the students would work at home, and then flipping that around so that the group space is then transformed into a dynamic interactive learning environment because this is where the students are now working on those questions and those problems that you would normally have set uh, for homework for students to complete. So this is why they call it the flipped model or flipped learning, because you're flipping those two ideas uh, or those practices uh, around. Now, is it really a new concept? Well, it's not entirely a new thing. So in some ways, uh, you may already be doing this just in a different form. And in fact, teachers have been doing this kind of thing uh, for decades now. So if you think about how you assign a specific task for students to complete at home, prior to a lesson. Uh, well, this is nothing really new. Okay? We, we do this quite, uh, quite often where we might ask students to read an article or a textbook uh, or to investigate something or conduct an interview perhaps. Something that they have to do at home that is going to then prepare them for the lesson the next day. Okay? Like I said, this in itself is nothing new. However, the one thing that you could never assign for homework was you. So when it came to delivering the content that you needed to deliver, so whether it was an explanation or a demonstration of some kind, we had to do that ourselves because obviously that's what we're there to do. And because we had to do it, it had to take place in the classroom. So this element of the learning was always something that had to be confined to the classroom. And that's until now. And this is what flipping the classroom is getting to the heart, to the heart of. So think for a moment, what if you could record the lecture that you would normally give in class and assign that as the homework, or in some cases, possibly group work, which we'll talk about after. Now, how we're able to do this is basically because of advances in technology, uh, and as well as things like how affordable technology has become and students' access to technology. So if we look at things like YouTube, which every CEO teacher has an account for now, uh, if you look at how internet speeds and bandwidths have increased so dramatically in recent times, if we think about Wi-Fi, um, when it's reliable, of course, um, as well as mobile technologies. So even for those schools that are going towards a BYOD model, uh, this is still something that can be embraced because videos on YouTube can be watched and can be accessed on basically any device, right? whether it be a tablet device, a laptop, even a smartphone, right? they can be watching these videos. So the technology is what has brought this to the fore so that we can now move the lecture from the classroom um, outside of the classroom. So just to try and demonstrate how this works and the effectiveness of it then, I thought I'd just take you through a model of what the traditional lesson uh, tends to be. So if we think about the traditional lesson, we might have that first part where the teacher lectures or delivers some sort of content to the students. And this can be in a variety of ways. It can be the teacher explaining a certain concept. That can be outlining the theme. Uh, it can be a demonstration uh, or a modeling of something. Um, it could be uh, an experiment in a science lab, whatever the case may be. There's some sort of lecture or delivery that goes on. The second part of a lesson is then usually when students are assigned an activity or right, well, something that is going to reinforce the content that has just been delivered. And again, quite common examples of this might be things like answering questions, they might have problems that they need to solve, or they might have to respond to some sort of stimulus in some way. And then usually the third element to this lesson would be the teacher then checking the students' responses to gauge their understanding of the content to make sure they're on, on the right track uh, before then moving on. And there's a number of ways that this can happen. It can be something as simple as showing of, of hands to get people to call out their answers or randomly checking on students. Very rarely would we have enough time though to get around to every single student. The problem here though is that, as a lot of you would probably realise, that often by the time we get through this first part of the lesson, usually we might just get started with the students 
answering questions or get, doing an activity. And often it's it's at this time that the bell will go. Okay, let's be honest. The bell goes, and so this aspect of the lesson becomes homework. Right? And the students are sent home to answer questions and bring it back the next day. And what often then happens as a result is that this third part of the lesson becomes the first part of the next lesson. And sometimes we don't spend as much time on it as we'd like because we need to sort of hurry up and get through this so that we can move on and then start with the next delivery of content that we need to get through. So this area here where the students are actually engaged in the activity and where they actually need the teacher probably more than at any other time, instead they're stuck having to do this alone at home. If they're lucky, they might have mum or dad to help them. Obviously, that's not ideal. So the teacher is only present in these two elements of the lesson. If we move to the flipped lesson, what happens there is the teacher now records the lesson that they would normally give in the class, and that gets assigned for homework. And again, this can happen in a number of ways. So you may have a slide or a PowerPoint presentation that you just go through with audio commentary. It could be you demonstrating an experiment. It could be an instruction of how to scaffold a response or how to break down a poem or a piece of literature. And then the students complete the given activities in class with you there to help them. So in a sense, what we then have is we have the teacher going from being a lecturer to now being more of a tutor, a tutorer or a facilitator. And if we go back to that lesson structure that we had, we now have a situation where the teacher is present in these two aspects of the student learning or of the teaching and learning. Right? The delivery is now taking place at home and these two aspects where the students most need us and most need our assistance uh, is where we can actually help them and be there to guide them through the process. Now, hopefully that's that's sort of hitting the mark and you can understand you know, that explanation of what flipping the classroom is. What I'm going to do now is uh, show you a short video uh, from Salman Khan. If you're not aware of who Salman Khan is, uh, he was the founder of the Khan Academy, which is an, an online resource of similar to YouTube, I suppose, but um, in the sense that it's all educational videos for student learning. Um, and this is him talking about how he got started and how he came across the idea of uh, screencasting and recording video type lessons. And like a lot of good ideas uh, and inventions throughout history, it was one of those things that came about as a bit of an accident. Uh, it wasn't really intentional. So I'm just gonna play this uh, for you now. It goes for about six or seven minutes. And then we'll talk about that after. Khan Academy is most known for its, its collection of videos, so before I go any farther, uh, let, let me show you a little bit of a, a montage. So the hypotenuse is now going to be five. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here, and in this part of Africa. We could integrate over the surface, and the notation usually is a capital sigma, National Assembly. They create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. Notice, this is an aldehyde, and it's an alcohol. Start differentiating into effector and memory cells. A galaxy, hey, there's another galaxy. Oh look, there's another galaxy. And for dollars is their 30 million plus the 20 million dollars from the American manufacturer. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. We now have uh, on the order of, of, of 2200 videos covering everything from basic arithmetic all the way to, to, to vector calculus and some of the stuff that, that you saw up there. Uh, we have a, a million students a month using the site, watching on the order of 100 to 200,000 videos a, a day. Uh, but, but what we're going to talk about in this is, is how we're going uh, to the next level. Uh, but before I, I do that, I, I want to talk a little bit about really just how I got started. And uh, so, some of you all might know, about five years ago, I was an analyst at a hedge fund, and I was 
in Boston and I was tutoring my cousins in New Orleans remotely. And I started putting the first YouTube videos up really just as kind of a nice to have, just kind of a supplement for my cousin, something that might you know give, give him a refresher or something. And as soon as I put those first YouTube videos up, something interesting happened, uh, actually a bunch of interesting things happened. The first was the feedback from my cousins. They told me that they preferred me on YouTube than in person. And, and, and what's what you get over the backhanded nature of that? I, there was actually something very profound there. They were saying that they prefer the automated version of their cousin to their cousin. At first, it's very unintuitive, but when you actually think about it from their point of view, it makes a ton of sense. You have this situation where now they can pause and repeat their cousin. Now they can, without feeling like they're wasting my time, they could, if they have to uh, review something that they should have learned a couple of weeks ago or maybe a couple of years ago, uh, they, they don't have to be embarrassed and, and ask their cousin. They can just watch those videos. If they're bored, they can go ahead. They can watch it at their own time, at their own pace. And probably the, the, the least appreciated, uh, I guess, aspect of, of this is the notion that the very first time, the very first time that you're trying to get your brain around a new concept, the very last thing you need is another human being saying, do you understand this? And that's what was happening with the, the interaction with my cousins uh, before, and now they can just do it kind of in, 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 kind of a, in the intimacy of their, of, their, of their own room. The other thing that happened is, you know, I put them on YouTube just, just you know, for, for the, you know, I, I, I saw no reason to make it private, so I, I let other people watch it, and, and then people started stumbling on it. And, and I started getting some comments and some letters and, and all sorts of kind of feedback from, from random people around the world. And you know, these are just a few. This is actually from one of the original calculus videos. And someone wrote just on YouTube, it was a YouTube comment. First time I smiled doing a derivative. And let's, let's, let's pause here. This person did a derivative and then they smiled. And then in response to that same comment, this is on the thread, you can go on YouTube and, and look at these comments. Someone else wrote, same thing here. I actually got a natural high and a good mood for the entire day. Since I remember seeing all of this matrix text in class, and here I'm all like, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a lot of feedback along those lines. You know, it was clearly it was helping people. But then as, as the viewership kept growing and kept growing, I started getting letters from, from people, and it was, it was starting to become clear that it was actually more than just a nice to have. Uh, th this is just a, an excerpt from one of, one of those letters. Uh, my 12-year-old son has autism and has had a terrible time with math. We have tried everything, viewed everything, bought everything. We stumbled on your video de on decimals, and it got through. Then we went on to the dreaded fractions. Again, he got it. We could not believe it. He is so excited. And so you can imagine, you know, here I was, uh, 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 an analyst at a hedge fund. Uh, I, it, it was very strange for me to do something of social value. But I was excited, so I kept going. And then a few things, other things started to dawn on me. That not only would it help my cousins right now, or, or these people who were sending letters, but it could maybe that this content will never go old, that it could help their kids or their grandkids. If Isaac Newton had done YouTube videos on calculus, I wouldn't have to. <laughs> uh, assu assu assuming he was good. I mean, <laughs> The other thing that happened, you know, even at this point, you know, I said, okay, maybe it's a good supplement, it's good for motivated students, it's good for maybe homeschoolers, but I didn't think it would be something that would somehow penetrate the classroom. But then I started getting letters from teachers, and the teachers would write saying, we've used your videos to flip the classroom. You've given the lectures. So now what we do, and this could actually happen in every classroom in America tomorrow, what I do is I assign the lectures for homework, and what used to be homework I now have the students doing in the classroom. And I want to I want to pause here for I, I want to pause here for a second because there's a couple of interesting things. One, when those when those teachers are doing that, there's there's the obvious benefit. There's the the benefit that now their their students can enjoy the videos in the way that my cousins did. They can pause, repeat at their own pace. 
uh, at their own time. But the more interesting thing, and this is the unintuitive thing when you talk about technology in the classroom, by removing the one-size-fits-all lecture from the classroom and letting, and letting students have a self-paced lecture at home, and then when you go to the classroom, letting them do work, having the, the teacher walk around, having the peers actually be able to interact with each other, these teachers have used technology to humanize the classroom. They took a fundamentally dehumanizing experience, a bunch of 30 kids with their fingers on their lips, not allowed to interact with each other. A teacher, no matter how good, has to give this kind of one-size-fits-all lecture to 30 students, you know, blank faces, slightly antagonistic, and now it's a human experience. Now they're actually interacting with each other. So once the Khan Academy kind of, you know, I, I quit my job and, and, and we turned into a real organization where a not-for-profit, um, the question... Yeah, okay. okay, so we'll just sort of stop it there because that's um, he then goes on to talk a little bit more about the Khan Academy and what he does there. But I thought first we'll just go through what some of those points were um, that Sal Khan makes. So one of the first ones he says here is the fact that students preferred the video rather than having the teacher in person. So for example, they could pause and rewind without feeling like they were interrupting or wasting the teacher's time. Uh, they could revise and watch the videos again later before exams. Uh, so it was a great source of revision. Uh, they could watch it in their own time at their own pace. So they could watch it on, as I was saying before, iPads, tablets, even smartphones. Um, they can be watching this on the bus or in the car on the way home. Um, and lastly, they could do so in the peace and comfort of their own room with no disruptions. The second point he makes there is about the fact that some content doesn't get old. So the same lecture or the same demonstration that you give year after year can now just be done just for once and recorded and assigned. And especially high school teachers, if you think about the fact that if you no longer have to deliver this content in class all the time, it's going to free up a lot more time for you to then concentrate on the skills and the more higher order activities uh, that you often don't always have as much time to do or as much time uh, as you like to. So you can focus more on improving things like literacy or essay writing, completing past HSC questions, for example. And then finally, he talks about removing the one-size-fits-all lecture. So the lecture that happens in class that it might be too fast for some students and too slow for others. So this way they can watch the lecture at their own pace. And as he says there, it humanises the classroom. So you have more time in class now for that personal interaction and attention to each of the students' needs. And for us, this means greater ability to differentiate uh, within our lessons and within the classroom. And it's on that point that I really want to stress one thing uh, about the whole flipped model, the flipped lesson. And that is, it's not about the technology. That is not what this is about. And Sal Khan makes a similar point. The technology is what makes this possible, being able to record and screencast. But the real authentic learning that takes place is determined by what you then do in the classroom as a result of having this free or this extra time. We can't think of it as something that is going to provide us with more time so that we can just sit at our desk and maybe catch up on marking or, or do other things. That is not the purpose of this. All the lessons, they still need to be structured and they need to have engaging and challenging activities uh, along with that teacher interaction. Uh, that is the core of this model and that is what makes the flipped classroom uh, effective. So, just to go through now some examples of actual flipping in action. I'll give you some of the information that I've gathered from my own research and from what other teachers, uh, or what I've got from other teachers uh, in other schools, both primary and secondary. And I'll show you a couple of examples uh, then as well. So first of all, the information I'm just going to show you now is, like I said, it's real case studies. Um, there was three, three teachers who presented on flipped learning at the Southern Region Building Capacity Showcase uh, at the end of last year. Um, each of those three teachers were from three different schools. 
uh, and they have taught a unit of work um, over the year which ranged from five to ten weeks uh, of a teaching unit. Uh, those three classes consisted of a year 12 English, a year 9 English and a year 11 biology class. Uh, and I'm also using information that I gathered from uh, the teachers at uh, OLMC Primary School in Mount Pritchard who are using uh, an app called Verso which I'll talk more about a bit later too. Um, and that was in relation to a year two, three uh, and year six class. So some of the benefits then that came out of all this from my own experience and, and from the experience of these other teachers uh, within the southern region. One of the first benefits was that there was a significant increase in homework completion. So it was one class, for example, that went from 40 to 70% completion rate up to 80 to 100% completion of homework. Uh, there was another class that noted completion uh, at 95%. It moved the passive thinking to home and the more high order thinking to the classroom. And I think this is what accounts for why there was such an increase uh, in the completion of homework by students. So a lot of the time when we set difficult tasks or challenging tasks for students to complete at home, um, often the homework doesn't get done because if they don't understand the content um, and they don't understand how to apply it and they don't have us or someone else there to help them with it, it becomes too difficult. And often a lot of the reason why students aren't completing homework is because it appears too difficult for them so they don't even bother to attempt it because they'd rather not attempt it than have a go and fail. So by moving the passive thinking to home, and remember it is very passive thinking, to sit and watch a video and maybe just take down a few notes doesn't really re require a great amount of brain energy. Right? So it is quite passive and so therefore they're more inclined to do it, um, especially if they know that if they don't watch the video it's going to put them behind then when they go into the classroom because they won't understand what's being discussed. So definitely increasing homework completion was a great benefit that came about from this. One of the other benefits that were noted uh, was an increase in the amount of writing that was completed by students and this therefore meant that they had greater writing skills. And again this comes down to the fact that you're, you're moving this task to the classroom where students are more inclined to complete writing tasks in the classroom with the teacher there and also with their other peers to be able to help them as opposed to attempt writing tasks at home because they can be quite laborious and they can be quite boring sometimes and if it's very difficult again they might not even attempt it in the first place. So simply moving that to the classroom means they are doing it more and they are therefore developing their writing skills at the same time. Um, another great benefit of course as I mentioned earlier is a more effective use of time itself. So there was one teacher there who noted that there was a unit they taught that normally would have taken four lessons to teach. Um, by doing it with the flip model they were able to complete this in only two lessons. So it's freeing up much more time which as we all know for us as teachers you know, is a very precious thing. Uh, another great benefit was the ability to challenge the high-end students whilst at the same time working more closely with the struggling students. So that idea or that notion of differentiation. Because what it means is that those high-end students can go about working and completing the tasks on their own or in their groups and you are then able to go around and be more of that tutor and play that tutoring role to you know, your special needs students or just students who are having a bit more trouble or maybe just need a bit more time to grasp uh, what we're trying to teach. There is an increased ability for student collaboration because now you have a situation where the students are completing their homework or what used to be homework uh, activities together. They can work on it together themselves um, as opposed to being stuck trying to work through it at home alone. Uh, and it has also helped to get students to the point where they could learn on their own. Students become much more independent learners because the other thing this is teaching students is to take more responsibility for their learning. There's a responsibility on them to make sure that they've watched the video or watched the instruction before they then come to the lesson and come to class. And one of the final benefits that was noticed there or observations was that uh, in one of these classes the teacher noted that most students, so over half the class, actually watched each of these videos uh, more than once and they were able to track that um, just by the views of the video. 
some of the considerations now. So these are some of the things that teachers found that uh, when you go about now using the flip model, just things that you need to consider about how you plan the videos and how you plan your lessons. Uh, the first and probably the greatest thing that you need to consider uh, is the length of the video. Okay, the length of the video is very important. Um, and in this case, in relation to secondary students, it was found, and this was a common thing amongst uh, all the teachers that, that discuss this, uh, that 15 to 20 minutes seemed to be about the optimal length uh, for a video. And the reasons for that were because if, if the video was too long, if you had a video that went for 30 minutes or more, students would tend to tune out after a while. Okay, it's a long time for them to be sitting and focusing. Um, they also found that if the videos were too short, if they were five minutes or less, a lot of the time it had the reverse effect and students wouldn't bother to watch them because I suppose they realised that they could very easily watch these at the start of the next lesson and catch up without it really being too detrimental. So that 15 to 20 minutes was found to be uh, ideal. Now just keep in mind that was for secondary students. With primary students, it's a very different kettle of fish. Uh, when it came to primary students, and uh, for obvious reasons, because they're younger and attention spans are a little bit less, um, five minutes or less actually proved to be the most effective when it came to primary uh, students with this flipped learning model. Okay? So obviously it's one of those things that's going to be, you know, it's going to vary and it's going to be flexible depending on the age of your students and just knowing you know, the ability of your students as well uh, and what they're capable of. Another consideration was uh, try not to make every video look the same. Okay, so after a while that can get a little bit boring, a little bit monotonous. Uh, try to change up the backgrounds, change the colours of your slides, change the themes, just to make each of the videos a little bit fresh. Otherwise it does get a little bit, uh, a bit boring, I guess, after a while. Uh, another Note, another teacher noted that uh, it was really important that the flipped model was clearly explained uh, to the students before they actually instituted this, uh, this model. Um, don't just walk into a lesson all of a sudden and say, OK, tonight I'm going to get you to watch this video and we'll discuss it tomorrow. Uh, it's really important that the students understand why you are teaching them in this way uh, so, that, so that they are going to be more willing to embrace it. And one teacher actually noted she, she didn't do this with one of the classes. She just walked in and said, you know what, start watching these videos for me. Um, and the response from the students was not uh, as positive as opposed to when she'd actually explained uh, the reasoning behind it first. And look, the final point there is something that I've probably already elaborated on, and that is um, not to disregard the structure of the lesson. Okay, the video is, of course, the, the catalyst for all of this, but the real learning takes place in the classroom. And it's really important then that you do have structured activities and engaging activities for the students to work on uh, when they arrive in the classroom. Otherwise, it all just sort of goes out the back door. Now, just in terms of the student response to this, so there's a few quotes here of actual students' responses uh, to the flip model and also just some overall um, general responses. So one was uh, a student commented that it gave me a chance to think about my work rather than just doing it quickly. There was another student who said that they liked that they could rewind and pause the lectures. So it was similar to what uh, you saw with Salman Khan. Uh, and there was another comment that they can go at their own pace. Some of the other uh, responses from the students were things like they, they liked the fact that they had resources to go back to uh, for revision before exams. Uh, some students thought it was an effective method simply because it was something different. So if for nothing else it was just a different uh, way of learning and they liked that and that engaged them. Another response from some students with one particular class was that uh, they were very appreciative of the work that the teacher had put into it. I actually commented to the teacher uh, and thanked her for all that work in developing those videos. And because they appreciated the amount of time the teacher had put into the lessons, they then were more likely to actually do the work and get involved themselves because they saw the lengths that the teacher went to to try and help them with their learning. Uh, another response was that students found themselves more motivated to learn and to do the activities. And 
the quieter students came out of their shell a lot more and they became a lot more confident, a lot more comfortable joining in the class discussion because they understood the content more and they'd been able to discuss the content collaboratively, collaboratively uh, with their peers. And so that was another uh, great response uh, from this. So look, there are a lot of the benefits and a lot of the positives that come out of the flipped model. Um, what I'm going to quickly show you now before we go into actually how to create videos and, and you can have a bit of a hands-on go uh, with how to use some of this sort of software. I thought I'd just quickly show you a couple of examples um, of my own uh, just to, to demonstrate how this can be done. Uh, so the first example that I'll show you is this was one of my first attempts at a flipped lesson. Um, I did it with a year seven history class where we're looking at uh, medieval Europe and it's a very basic um, example of a flipped uh, lesson. It's actually using videos that I got from YouTube. I didn't even have to create these videos yourself. And this is another great thing about the flip model. You don't have to create the videos yourself. There are so many out there already. Um, so you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, but in that ex this example I'll show you, it incorporates a lot of other cloud share tools as well. And the second example I'll show you is a little bit different because it's aimed at a year 12 legal studies class. And in this one, uh, it's actually a screencast uh, that I've made with audio which was just adapting a slide share presentation that I had into a video. So just going across now, showing you that first example. So what you're seeing here is a, is a Google site. This is a website that I had created for my year seven history class. And the lessons are just put in there as separate pages. And so this was one flip lesson that I had them do. Uh, this was looking at castles where they were looking at the different ways that castles were attacked and were defended. There were three videos uh, that I wanted the students to watch and they're only very short. This is a year seven class, so you might not be able to see, but uh, this video here is two minutes 54. The other videos are three minutes and two minutes long as well. And all I wanted the students to do for homework was to watch the videos and they just had to then make or well, type down 15 points that they gained from these three videos. And they just typed those points into what was a Google form. And that Google form was just embedded next to the videos. So they just typed in each of their 15 points into the form, and then they hit submit. And that was all they had to do. Watch those videos and take down 15 points. What then happened when they came into the classroom, for anyone who's used Google Forms before, uh, you'll know that uh, it then all those answers from the forms are then populated into a spreadsheet. So I ended up with this spreadsheet with all the answers from each of the students. And this was good in a couple of ways. First of all, um, it showed me who had done their homework. Um, the names here I've actually deleted because of privacy reasons, obviously. Um, but the name of each student would come up in the sheet with all of their responses from the video. So very quickly, I got an idea of who had done their homework and who hadn't, if I wanted to. And then in the lesson, the students were shared with these responses. So they, they could then see their own responses as well as all the responses from the other students. And from there, there's a couple of different activities uh, that we did around that. So um, basically, I got them to have a look at what other students had picked uh, similar points from them. If there were any points that other students had made that they had missed or that they hadn't done. And in groups, they were able to then discuss you know, what they thought were the more important points or why they learnt, uh, left certain points out, for example. And so we had some discussion around what were the most important aspects of those three videos um, around, if we go back to here, around attacking and defending the castles. So after generating some discussion around that, the students then came to an agreement about what were some of those important things about the videos, and then they were able to then use those points to write a more structured answer and a more structured piece of writing about how castles were attacked and how they were defended. So that was very, very basic, um, but it was a very good activity that embraced all those elements of, of the flipped uh, method. And like I said, that was using videos that already existed, so it didn't require me to actually create them. It was just a matter of embedding them there. In the other example, sorry, I might just stop there in case anyone has any questions at this point. 
probably should have stopped a little earlier. Um, probably going a little bit fast, I understand. Hi, um, we've just requested access just to the site that we're looking, flipping the classroom. Into the... Is that what we're looking at now with your legal studies? No, no, these are separate websites um, that I've created for my classes. So I wouldn't have shared these with you to begin with if that's what you're asking. Yep, no, no, that's okay. Oh, okay, yeah, so I'm just sort of yeah, just showing you on the screen how they work. I think that's Thank the you. flipped, the oh, flipped lesson. Yeah. It's actually Aaron on the Hangout. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, I, hang I, out. sorry. Okay. That's okay, I shared the, uh, I told, I just gave you the link to the, the... Oh, okay, yeah, that's that, That's not live yet. Okay, so the right. flip in the classroom website that Aaron that you're looking at is hasn't gone live yet because we haven't uh, uh, finished completing it yet. There's still some elements to go with that. So. All right, thank you. So I, I thought I saw someone else with a hand up who had a question. Hi there. Um, this is Dominic from All Saints Senior College. Um, I wanted to know whether in Google Forms when you're sharing this, um, when you when you're doing you were speaking about the collaborative learning um, from yep. the YouTube videos. Can the other students see the responses from other students? Not straight away. So the way that I would have done it uh, was that this spreadsheet that had all the responses in it, what wouldn't have been shared with them at first, uh, it would have been kept private. And then after they had done the homework activity, uh, it's really just a matter of that spreadsheet. If you just uh, if you share it as in um, anyone with the link can view, so rather than sharing it specifically with the class, you just put anyone with the link and view it. And because the students um, already have access to this Google site, it means that they could then see all the responses. So right. they wouldn't have been able to see it at first when they did it themselves at home. Okay. Mm. It's a good way of checking homework as well, I suppose. Yeah, it does. And um, it gives you a timestamp as well when it's done, all that sort of thing. So it, it's got a, a few good sort of pluses to it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll just go on then with the next example. Uh, it doesn't know if there's any other questions. The other example, like I said, is a little bit different. This is Year 12 Legal Studies. Uh, and again, I've got a similar page set up for them where what used to happen in the past was I had a PowerPoint um, embedded there and they would just go through each slide. But instead now I've created um, a, a YouTube video which does the exact same thing, uh, which is just me talking through it. So these slides here, which are looking at the purposes of punishment, if I just hit play on that. Confusion is something that you will not hear or use very often anymore. I'll just mute it, but it's, it's just basically me talking over those slides. So this is what I would normally have done in the past where I went through these slides and explained them to the class in the classroom. Um, I just recorded my voice over the slides and set that for them to watch, and it just goes through there. So really not a lot of effort went into that. The PowerPoint slides I already had uh, it was just a matter of me recording my voice, explaining over it, and recording it using Screencast-O-Matic, which is what I'm going to show you in a moment, um, and then just posting that um, on their site for them to watch. But even if I didn't have a site, I could just send them the link of this YouTube video and they could watch it that way. Um, that would be much quicker and much easier. Um, so, yeah. So, that were my two just little examples. They're very simple. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be anything too strenuous, but... Um, that is a couple of ways that I've been able to do it. Does anyone have any other questions then before I go on? Okay. All right, well, the next thing then is to actually look at now, well, how to actually make these videos. Hopefully, I've sold you all along the whole idea and the model, um, and you can see the benefits of it, and, and are now really eager to try and do this for yourself. So, the, the, the piece of software that I use and I suggested for you guys is what's called Screencast-O-Matic. Um, the benefits of this is that it's free to download, it's very simple to use, runs on Windows and Macs uh, and Mac. Um, look, there is one point with this, the free version, um, it has a limit of 15 minutes. So you can't make a video of more than 15 minutes in length. Having said that, I actually think that's a good thing. Because if you remember I said before, really you don't want to go much more than 15 minutes for a video anyway. Having this function will actually in, ensure that you keep to that limit so that you're not making videos that are way too long. So really this shouldn't be too much of a hindrance um, for you. 
I've said there that it's for beginners, but really even advanced users would still use this software. It's just very simple and very straightforward. Should you want to look at other programs, there are there's thousands out there. Some of the better ones I've listed here. And these are ones that if you are an advanced user with making videos and want to go for all the bells and whistles and you know make it into a Hollywood blockbuster, um, you can use more advanced video uh, creating software like iMovie and Camtasia, uh, things like that. On the iPad, there's two very good ones called Edu Creations and Explain Everything uh, that are quite popular as well. This one here, Verso, um, I'll just quickly point out, this is a bit different in the sense that this is an app for the iPad that has been created specifically for flipped learning. Um, it actually comes with an interface where you embed the videos and you embed questions as well. And it allows you as a teacher to, um, to retrieve all the responses from the teachers all within the one app. So this app, Verso, unfortunately it's not free, but this actually just brings everything together. Uh, in a very nice little interface and nice little package. So if you do have the, op the option, um, look up Verso on their website. Um, this is what the teachers at OLMC Mount Pritchard uh, have been using for a little while now uh, with great amounts of success. Um, so have a look out for that one. I'm just going to get out of this uh, presentation mode because what I want to do is now go into Screencast-O-Matic. So if you want to follow along and do this on your own computer, um, please be my guest. But I'll just show you how quick and how easy it is to use this software. So if I open up Screencast-O-Matic, you'll see that uh, I want to just use the free version. So I'll click on that. And then what you'll see is a little dotted line screen uh, will come up, basically telling me what part of my screen is going to be recorded. Now there's quite a few options that I've got here. Uh, if I click on uh, this icon at the bottom, what that will bring up are the different sizes of the screen that is going to be captured. So I can go small, medium, or full HD, which you can see there is almost the entire screen. Um, or I can actually go an option there which says full screen, so it will actually just record uh, everything that's there. Can I recommend though, there are a few other options here. But can I recommend that you stick to small HD, medium, and full HD? The reason being because that will ensure that the quality of your video is kept in high definition. Whereas using some of these other sizes, uh, it won't necessarily capture high definition and therefore it may not look very good or may not look very clear. And in some cases, writing might get blurred and things like that. So it's best to stick to the HD uh, sizes if you can. Now in my case, I'm going to go with medium because if I'm going to record this presentation, medium fits nicely over the size of my slides there. So to move it, I just click on this little section on the left and I can drag it around wherever I want. The other option I've got too is if I actually want to record myself in the video. So you'll see now in a moment, my camera will come up and I can have that as part of the recording if I like. And I can drag that around um, as well. So if you needed to keep yourself in the presentation, uh, that option is available. And then lastly, you've got an option here for your microphone if for whatever reason you need to mute your microphone. You can turn that off. So they're the basic options that you have. Once you've set yourself up, it's then just a matter of clicking on record. You'll get a countdown, three, two, one. And from this point, everything I say is being recorded and everything I do on the screen within this red box is being recorded. Okay. So you can see now why it's so popular and, and why I recommend it because it is just very, very simple. Um, having said that, it does get a lot better. You can see there is a timer down there and I've got 15 minutes max. If I make a mistake and need to restart, I can do that. But let's say, for example, that I've recorded everything I wanted and I was finished. I would simply click done and this is where this program makes things almost even easier for you. You'll see now I've got the video which I can play first if I want to just to on this point everything I say is being recorded. So you, you can hear it there. Um, so you can play it first to check that it's all okay. This option here is what's really great. So this means that we can publish this video straight to YouTube. You can also publish it to Screencast-O-Matic in their own server, 
although we probably wouldn't have to worry about that. YouTube is probably where we want to publish it. The other option you've got, should you want to actually keep a hard copy of the video locally on your hard drive, you can select this option here. For the purpose of this though, if we select publish to YouTube, you'll see it gives you some options. You can give it a title. So I'll just call it VC. And in the description, I'll just call it VC session. I can change the category if I want, although education is probably what I want. In terms of the privacy, it's defaulted to make it private for you. Uh, you can also make the video public. There is a third option of unlisted, which you can't pick in the free version. But once you've got it on YouTube, you can then make it unlisted from there. So there's a bit of a workaround. Um, and the final thing you would have to do is to select your YouTube account. Now, because I've used this before, it automatically remembers my account. The first time you use it, you would simply have to go in there and put in your YouTube account, which is your Sid.Catholic account. And then it's just a matter of then clicking upload to YouTube. And there you'll see there, it's now encoding and then it will upload that onto YouTube automatically. So Gordon, that's, I guess that's a good thing to remind people about that every staff member across the Archdiocese has their own YouTube account. Yep. Uh, you just go to youtube.com and when you um, go to YouTube up the top right hand corner, you'll see a little blue button that says sign in. Simply hit that button and if you're, al if you're already signed into your CloudShare account, it will sign you in automatically. And that allows you to you know, upload your own videos, as you're doing here now, yep. uh, create channels, have people subscribe to those channels, etc. Uh, I guess the, the related point to that is that as well as every staff member having uh, a YouTube account, every student has a YouTube account as well. So students can create and upload their own videos if they wish as well. Yeah, exactly. If this was something you wanted students to do as part of an activity, they can do the exact same thing. You'll see there my, my upload is already completed. Uh, obviously, it will take longer if the video is longer, but that's all done. And there's a link there so that I can go straight to that video um, on YouTube. And once it's in YouTube, that's where you can change things like those sharing permissions. So there's that little video I've just made. If I now wanted to make the privacy unlisted, I can do that now. God, could you just explain for people what unlisted for, means? For people who don't understand uh, the term unlisted in terms of privacy, uh, what that's meaning there is that it's not public in the sense that no one can find my video by doing a search, but I just need to send the link to people and they can then watch it. So anyone can watch it as long as they have the link, but they won't be able to find it in a search. That's usually a popular option because um, if you want it to be partly private, um, but obviously still have certain people watch it like your students or like your colleagues, um, that's a good option. Unlisted is a good option to have. Um, and if you want to go take it further and if you would embed the video into a, a Google site, by making it unlisted, uh, it means that only people that you share the Google site with will be able to see the video. Okay. But essentially that's uh, as simple as it is. Um, there are other ways you can share it, of course, once it's on YouTube. So if you hit share, to make that unlisted first. I have to go back, I have to go back to about. So let's. Oh, you didn't save, yeah. Oh, I didn't save. So let's make it unlisted and save. And then go to share. Oh, oh. okay. No, no. Oh. See, it's unlisted. It's like weird. It's a bit weird. Let's try it again. Okay. Well, sure why that's happening. It is, yeah, it's a little bit strange. Let me try it on. A video manager I'll try it on this one. Okay. okay, here we go. So, what should come up if you hit share is you get these different sharing options. You can either send the link or you can email the link directly out just by typing in uh, your students or uh, staff email addresses there. But anyway, I think that's pretty straightforward. Anyone have any questions about any of that? Just conscious of, uh, of the time, I think I yep, might have gone a little bit longer than I should have, but yeah. That's right, that's right on 4.30. Any questions, folks? You've all been nice and quiet, which is sometimes a good thing, sometimes <laughs> not. We hope, we, we hope, um, we hope you, uh, you found uh, I'll, that useful. I'm yeah, well, not quite finished yet, Not quite finished? Was there any questions just on how to, how to use that software or how to make the videos? Um, 
it's, it's not so much a question, but I generally use the QuickTime on my on my Mac. Is there anything yeah. that you can edit edit yeah. them easily with? For editing videos? Yeah. What do you mean? Um, look, in terms of uh, the editing sort of functions, well, there's actually a, there's quite a lot of editing functions within YouTube uh, that people may not be too aware of. Uh, so if I'm in YouTube and I go to Video Manager, and these are all videos that I've created, of course, and if I go to Creation Tools, and then you'll see there's an option there called Video Editor. And if I click on that, it will then bring up, you'll see there all the different videos that I've got. And it's a bit of an editing uh, interface similar to iMovie and some of those other ones, where I can now drag videos into here, and I can do some basic editing by cropping them if I want to crop the last few seconds off a video. Um, I can add two different videos together. Um, I can also drag audio if I want to play some music in the background. So there's some basic editing functions that you can do uh, all within YouTube itself. There's a whole bunch of other ones here if you, say for example, want to have text uh, written across a video, have some captions included, um, have titles. Um, there's quite a lot there that you can do. Um, so if it was just basic editing around that sort of thing, probably definitely do it within YouTube. Um, that way it just keeps it all nice and tidy in the one spot. Um, otherwise, I'd be looking at some of these programs here like Camtasia, iMovie, Movie Maker. They're more the type um, where you can cut and paste and, and do a lot more editing and those sort of functions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, okay, I hope that helps, yeah, so. It does, thank you. No problem. Any other questions from people around any of this? Yeah, I'll take that as a good sign because I mean it, it is quite straightforward. That software is pretty basic, so hopefully um, you found the same and and you've got plenty of time to go home and have a play around it yourself and that I suppose. Um, I'll just finish off. We're going to go into some questions and some uh, discussion time. Uh, I suppose that's that's pretty much what we've just done. So the last thing I usually like to to finish with is. Um, just some pointers on, on where to go from here. So if you are someone who, who hasn't tried this before and want to get started, um, it can be something that is a little bit daunting, I suppose, like anything that's new. Um, it might feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but again, like everything, with experience, trial and error, you sort of get the hang of it. The biggest thing I had to um, come to terms with was the sound of my voice. Um, <laughs> you, you hear your voice for the first time recorded, you know, everyone sort of thinks, well, geez, do I really sound like that? Um, and yeah, you just you just got to get over it, I guess. That's how you really sound, unfortunately. Um, so that was the most confronting thing to me, anyway. Um, but look, as I said, start small, uh, introduce the concept slowly, and that's not just for your benefit, but it's also for the benefit of your students. If you want them to adjust to this new type of teaching, you know, introduce it in, in little steps to them. Uh, another thing, don't try and make it perfect. Uh, it's actually it's actually been found that it's better to be casual. Um, if you try and make it too formal and too structured, it, it turns the students off. They actually prefer you to speak casually and, and how you would if you were in class. You know, they can relate to you a lot better that way. So don't worry if you make little mistakes here and there. Just, just have a laugh and roll with it. Um, <clears throat> the other big thing is to share. Um, if you know, if there's three or four of you that are teaching, you know, the same subject, the same class. You know, why each of you record your own video on the same content? Um, especially if you've got teachers there who might specialise in different areas. Um, have one teacher record videos for one topic, another one does it for the other, and share them with each other. Uh, it's a great way to collaborate uh, in terms of resources with each other that way too. Um, another point there, and this is just to dispel a bit of a myth. Um, people think that once you throw videos up on YouTube, um, that they're out there for everyone in the whole world to see. Well, as I've just demonstrated, you, know, you can set them to private. There are ways um, to make sure that your video isn't seen by everyone and anyone. Um, so you do have control of who sees your videos once they're up there. And the last point, 
as I think I mentioned earlier too, you know, don't go out there and try and reinvent the wheel. If you already know of some great videos out there on YouTube or Khan Academy or anywhere else they might be, just use them. Um, that's what I did in one of those examples, um, and that's going to save you a great amount of time too. Um, you know, if good resources are out there, then make use of them. I suppose is the message. So. Uh, anyway, look, with that, I suppose I might just throw it back to you know, any final questions or any final comments uh, people might have. Doesn't appear we're going to get any. Oh, yeah, go away. Yeah. Hi. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Oh, just, just a quick question. Um, I'm using a free freeware version of Screencast O Matic. How, yeah. how long does the free version last? Is it 30 days or a month? No, no, the, the free version lasts forever. It's just okay. that it comes with that just comes with that limited ability with a 15 minute maximum for your videos. Um, oh, okay. And I think yeah, and the paid version does have some other um, applications to it too. So it has some other like editing type features. So okay. some of those things that I was just showing in YouTube and, and the other programs do, you can do with a paid version. But look, Sorry, so for you... time, time-wise, it's 15-minute videos. That, that's right. That's 15. it, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. That's right, no problem. All right. So I guess the question is, uh, who, who's going to give it a crack? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Plenty of hands. Yeah, yeah, a few hands up. Yep. Sorry, go on. Yep. Um, have you got any tips for like making sure that the video is short enough or to the right length for your students? Yeah. Like, in as far as like you're planning them um, pacing your video? Um, really, it's it's a trial and error thing, I suppose. Um, obviously, I suppose if you think about the attention span of students, I remember I, I heard once. Um, someone told me that uh, you should look at attention span in terms of in terms of the age of the students. So if the students are 10 years old, their attention span is about 10 minutes. If they're 18, you might get 18 <laughs> minutes out of them, which tends to be you know, sort of closely accurate. Um, but it's really just trial and error. Um, you know, it depends on the level of your students. If you have an advanced class, for example, as opposed to a mixed ability class or a lower end class, um, just just see how you go with it. But like I said, from my experience and those other secondary teachers, they all found that 15 minutes to 20 minutes was quite optimal, especially for the seniors. Um, so that looked like the way to go. As I said, the primary though, it was completely different. It was five minutes or under, so yeah. Yeah, five minutes is plenty. They wriggle too much if it's any longer. There you go, so um, it just comes down to, to your kids, that's it, so. Good Thank que you. Good question, Aaron. No Thanks for that. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, look, thanks everyone uh, for joining the session, uh, for spending the time. Um, like I said, I've found this a great benefit in the classroom, and in particular with seniors, where it really is very heavy on content, and you need the time to get through that. I found it a great benefit. Um, so hopefully, it's something you can take away and uh, and use to your benefit in your classrooms. So. Yeah, thanks again. And uh, as you've got there on the slide, um, uh, Gordon, will they be able to get to these slides as well? Um, look, I'll, I'll put up a link when the video is ready. I'll put up a link to the slides as well as the video um, so they're both in the same place. That way you can access them. Too. So that's our normal practice that when you look at the video on YouTube, you'll see a link to the slide deck. So, folks, thanks very much for giving up your time again. Remember, in two weeks' time, we'll have the next and the final uh, CloudShare support session on teacher productivity. But uh, thank you to Gordon, fantastic job, mate. Um, and uh, hopefully that's inspired you to go out and flip your own classroom. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll say goodbye and uh, wish you all the best and see you next time. Thanks, everyone.